Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, because you were not able, we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. A reading from Proverbs. Wisdom cries out in the street. In the squares, she raises her voice. At the busiest corners, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Give heed to my reproof. I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refused, have stretched out my hand and no one heeded, and because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, 
I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when panic strikes you, when panic strikes you like a storm, and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel, and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and be sated with their own devices. For waywardness kills the simple, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But those who listen to me will be secure and will live at ease without dread of disaster. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you.
A reading from the letter of James. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we, do bits into, if we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now, Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, right, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, but still others, one of the prophets. And so he asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, why, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. But then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, you Satan! For you are setting your minds not on divine things, but on human things. And then he called the crowd over with his disciples, and he said to them, If any want to be my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel they will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with all the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to the Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts ever be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. When I was a teen, um, as teens often do, they sometimes talk back to their parents. And one time I spoke back to my mother and she told me, she said, you have a very big mouth. She said, you're gonna be either a priest or a lawyer. She didn't know how prophetic she was, I turned out to be both. And that's equally true now so that what happened, I apologize for the beginning of the uh, service with the feedback and all, because I gra grabbed Mother Mary's microphone by mistake. And in the sound settings, mine is turned way back in honor of my mother. Well, today, today's gospel lesson, we hear about this exchange between Peter and Jesus. Jesus is trying to tell his disciples what he sees happening. Some people will say he had this knowledge simply because he was the son of God. But then there's another way of looking at it, and that is that simply Jesus was so aware of his surroundings, his social situation, the political situation, the economic situation, all of the things in which they were living. And it was, as from the book of Daniel we hear, he saw the writing on the wall. Somehow, these things were going to happen to him, whether he liked it or not. Peter did not want to believe. No. Well, not that he didn't want to believe, but he didn't want these things to happen to Jesus. Because he loved Jesus. And we never want to see the people we love come into harm's way. In any way. And yet, they did happen to Jesus. It is a sort of 
fortunate twist of the lectionary, quite sometime, a little with a little design actually intended, that this gospel lesson would be read at this time of the year because on Tuesday we celebrate the Feast of the Holy Cross. And it is a feast day in our church. It is one of the few prayer book feast days that is celebrated by the church everywhere. And so we hear this gospel lesson on this Sunday because it is the Sunday closest to that day. It is there so that we can reflect a bit on what this cross thing is all about. For a very long time, and still to this day, Christian disciples are taught that the purpose of Jesus' life was so that he could suffer and die on the cross for our sins. In certain hymns and in other prayers, we hear it that he paid the debt of our sins. When we say things like that, we often don't think about what it really says about God. That somehow we conceive of the Father as some sort of vindictive God of the pagan era. That now that he has been offended, he demands sacrifice in order to make up, to reconcile. Now I'm not saying that that's not true of Jesus' death. It is, but that's not the whole story. And that's where we fail. Because if that's all it is, you have to really be deeply convinced that you are a really bad sinner before you really even start to think about the, the sense of what Jesus did for us. And there are a lot of people I know I've had conversations with them who struggle with this idea of faith in Christ and Christ's blood because all of a sudden then it looks like God, God is, that's not the kind of God they want to believe in. Now I'm not saying God has to be the God we want, but, but maybe it's not the full picture. And it's when we get only part of the picture that we can make some mistakes and go down the wrong road. Yes, Jesus atoned for our sins. He paid the price for our sins. But as I mentioned, the picture is much larger than that. Because you see, crucifixion, I know we've talked about it at other times, crucifixion was a gruesome death, and it was a death that was really uh, assigned to those who were convicted of high treason against the state. Insurrection, rebellion, And the whole idea behind it, behind that for the Roman authorities was once you saw what happened to someone who was crucified and the kind of death that they suffered, you would not want that for yourself. And so you would do everything to avoid it, including not being part of the insurrection or part of the treachery, part of the treachery that would bring down the state. That was the purpose of crucifixion. And it was more common than we think. Whenever one of the provinces rebelled, often the conquering general who came back to restore Rome's authority would then crucify a number of people, whether guilty or innocent, along the road into the main city so that people traveling there would see this. And in seeing it, they would never dare to cross the authority of the emperor. Well, we did away with crucifixion in the Christian era, but we're not all that much different. All we need to do is go into the Middle Ages where Christianity was everybody's religion and really one brand of Christianity was everyone's religion. And yet we know the stories from medieval England of those that were convicted of treason and were subject to the king's justice. The penalty for treason was to be drawn and quartered. I don't think it's any more civilized to do that than it was to crucify someone. Because as gory as it was, it meant that 
you would be hanged until you were almost dead, and then you would be revived, and then you would be racked. And while you were racked, they would slit open your abdomen, and they would start taking your organs out while you were alive. And if you still survive that, and whether you didn't or not, what they would do is tie you to four horses going in four different directions and slap the horses on the rump and have them take off. And you were split into pieces. And then those pieces were sent around to significant portions of the kingdom to warn, to warn against standing against the king's justice. The human mind, sometimes, imagine thinking that up. Thinking up crucifixion, thinking up being drawn and quartered. Sometimes we don't, we're not as civilized as we think we are. And yet Jesus, Jesus sees that this is his fate. And in some way he welcomes it with open arms. Because we know the story of the Passion. We tell it on Passion Sunday and then again on Good Friday and we know how Jesus stood mute before Pilate even though he could have made probably a very convincing legal argument to have himself at least punished and released rather than tortured and executed in the way he was. And so we need to understand that Jesus accepted this fate. He almost invited it. But why? You see, because if, if this God who demanded payment for sin, demanded some sort of human sacrifice in order to make sure that sin was taken care of, well, Jesus could have died in any number of ways. But Jesus died in the way that was most clear in the time that he lived that no one would accept that willingly except that this was to be a pledge of God's love for us and sometimes we forget when we think that the father needed this retribution on humanity so he caused Jesus to suffer and to die on the cross we keep forgetting that Jesus is God and so it's really God doing this himself. If we believe in the Trinity as we pro will profess in a few moments, then it is not some sort of vengeful pagan God seeking sacrifice for atonement of sin, but rather this is a definitive statement without doubt how much God will endure in order to reconcile you and me to himself. It is the statement of God's abiding and total love. So total. But not only would Jesus give up his life, but he would give it up in such a way that you could not doubt it. This definitive statement of God's love is what the cross is about. And so when Jesus says, take up your cross, that phrase itself made me a little squirrely because if Jesus died once and for all, for all our sins, why do I have to take up a cross? Why don't I just go on living my life the way I want to? Jesus paid the price after all. No, what Jesus is saying is this. If this cross that I am going to endure is the definitive statement of God's love for God's world, and you would be my disciple, then you need to be willing and able to express love on that same level. This is the love of which Jesus speaks when at the Last Supper he says to his friends, his disciples, love one another as I have loved you. So taking up the cross is an essential element of who we are as disciples of Christ. And that is worked out perhaps not in the suffering and torture of this instrument of death, 
but in our willingness to give up of our own lives, to give up of our own selves, to take our egos and push them to the side so that someone else can thrive. And the reason that is important for us as disciples of Christ is if we are all doing it, we are doing it for one another. It is like a marriage where two people are willing to give up everything for one another so that one may thrive. If the other does the same, both thrive and they thrive together in ways unimaginable. Imagine that multiplied by tens and hundreds and thousands and millions of people who since the time of Jesus have been willing to take up their cross. That's, that's what the cross is about. We take up a cross not so that we can justify suffering or something like that, but rather that we realize that it is the path of Jesus and that path means giving up ourselves so that others may live. by some happy, I guess, circumstance in some ways. We remember the tragedies of 9-11. We know where we were on that day. It is a dividing point, a reference point in our lives. And we can mourn the passing of those who were so innocently slaughtered and see somehow the cross of Jesus in that. But we see most faithfully the cross of Jesus in those who did not run away but ran to. The first responders who went, ran into the building even though it was dangerous and life-threatening because they saw as their mission giving life to others. It is a poignant photograph to see four firemen carry the lifeless body of Father Michael Judge out of the rubble. It looks almost like the Pietà. A priest of God, a Franciscan friar, who ran into the building because he saw this as his calling. To pray, to administer last rites, to strengthen where possible. And because he would do this, he lost his life. We have real life examples everywhere, in every age, of people willing to take up a cross. But it makes our taking it up no less dramatic if we realize that we cannot, like Peter, think with, in terms of the world, but rather to think in terms of the kingdom of heaven, a kingdom which is motivated by love, a self-sacrificing love that puts the self away so that others may thrive. Would that it is so for us, for one another in this place today, that we would resolve to be like Jesus. That we would take up our cross and do for one another as Jesus has done for us. To love. To love with all the fibers of our being. Because that is the way that God loves us. And we can love no less if disciples of Christ we would be. So, on this Sunday, the one nearest to Holy Cross Day, on this Sunday, the one nearest to the anniversary of 9-11, think of what the cross really means and how powerful it is when we do not see it simply as atonement for sin, but an unmistakable statement about the power of love.
in Christ's great act of love, he redeemed all of creation. And so this love is all about us now. Let us profess our faith and confidence in God as together we say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. And by the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. We pray especially for the Anglican Church of Tanzania, St. John's Palmerton, and the Constitution and, Command and Canons Committee the Diocese of Kajo Keiji and their Bishop Emmanuel Murray and St. Paul Bori Parish. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. We pray for Samuel and Kay, Kathy, Wilbur, and Charlotte, Garnet, and Joanne. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray especially for Joan, Barbara, Rosemary, Bud, Pat, Joey, Linda, Joyce, Gladys, and Bernice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Draw near to all and grant the peace of your presence, the healing of your touch, and your guidance and assurance of love, so that all who are weak and weary may walk in hope and in faith. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
So my friends, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. So now may Almighty God have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you all in eternal life. Amen. My friends, may the peace of the Lord be with you, Always. Scheduled soloist this morning had a family emergency and was not able to sing. And instead, we have her teacher. Uh, Gwendolyn was here earlier in the summer, and we're always privileged and happy to hear her and have her with us. So we thank Gwendolyn for pinch hitting and singing for us today.
For all things come of thee, O God. And of thy own. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. <clears throat> and let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For our sins he was lifted high upon the cross, that he might draw the whole world to himself, and by his suffering and death become the source of eternal salvation, for all who would put their trust in him. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of his name. Holy, gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus the Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and to die as one of us, so to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and there offered himself in obedience to your will as a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. Now on the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then after supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so we celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer to you these simple gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and the blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. And so sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and so serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And then at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joys of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, 
by him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. So now we pray as our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. Now and Given now are the gifts that are given for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Faithful God, in the wonder of your wisdom and love, you fed your people in the wilderness with the bread of angels, and you sent Jesus to be the bread of life. We thank you for feeding us with this bread. May it strengthen us that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may embody your desire and be renewed for your service. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. And so now, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your minds and hearts ever in the knowledge and love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may the full and abundant blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come upon you now and remain among you always. Amen. Amen. Go now in the peace of Christ to love and to serve the Lord. Thanks.